Hi. How you doing? Who's full? Raise your arm. Raise your hands. Who ate too much of the bacon? I heard it was cracked bacon. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming and sticking around and listening to a different presentation for the afternoon. So first of all, I want to take one quick second just to say thank you to iMedia. Um, iMedia was kind enough to bring me back here to have a, a session with some of the people in my book. And iMedia was nice enough to help you all get a copy of my book. So that's that big fat thing that's sitting on your table in front of you, hopefully. Um, you might have to check your bags on the way home. I apologize for that. It's a little bit heavy. But it was a lot of fun. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about that book and some of the stories in it. But we're also going to um, take this as an opportunity to not only just look back at the business, but to look forward in the business as well. So that book is called Internet Ad Pioneers. And it's the unsung stories of some of the people behind the birth and growth of the internet advertising industry. And I started that book two years ago. Um, it was something I was doing in my off time, evenings and weekends. And I have to say a big shout out to my wife and my two kids who allowed me to have that time somewhere in between them not sleeping, eating, pooping, so on and so forth. Um, that's my kids, obviously, not, <laughs> not my wife. Um, she'd be really upset if I said that. So I want to say thank you to them because they helped me put this book together. But originally, the book was actually an idea that was generated by one of my business partners, John Durham and Rich Lefergie. And the idea for the book was that this business has been around for about 18 years or so now. Uh, according to some people, the first internet ad goes back to 1994. And it was on Hotwired. And if you think about that as an analogy to you or me, when you're 18 years old, you have this chance to usually you go to college. You get to be a little introspective. You can reinvent yourself. You can look back on who you've been to date and look at the things that you've done and maybe some of the mistakes that you've made and some of the successes that you've had. And it gives you the opportunity to look forward and figure out where you want to go and where you want to be. It also gives you the opportunity to um, just kind of look back at some of the relationships you've had and the ways that you've addressed the world around you. Because this lays the groundwork for what you're going to be when you become a grown up. So if you take that analogy to our business at this point, this is a great opportunity for us to figure out what we're going to be when we grow up. You know, We've generated a lot of revenue in this business. There's been a lot of great ideas and interesting people in this business. So that's really what I wanted to do. This book idea was to start to herald some of the people behind this business. And I couldn't get to everybody. When I started working on this book, I had a list of about 75 people that I wanted to talk to. And it quickly became too difficult to talk to everyone. Everyone was very, very busy. Um, so I was able to call it down to, for the, at least for the first version, if I do another volume down the line or not, but 31 interviews of people that some you may have heard of, some you may not have heard of. Some people have been very influential in ways that you didn't necessarily think of. Um, in the book, there's the people who bought the first internet ad and the people that sold the first internet ad. Those people, for the most part, are in this room, actually. Um, so they've stuck with the business for a very long period of time. There are people in that book that developed basically the first ad networks. There are people that defined the impression. There are people that built the terms and conditions at the Aspen Group that was founded at iMedia probably 12 years ago. Um, a lot of the infrastructure of this business was created at events like this. So I just figured it was a good chance for us to go back and look at some of the things that they had done. So before I bring up the panelists, I wanted to just go through a couple quick pictures. Um, first of all, these are some of the reviews from my book. So I tried to call together a couple of the best reviews so that when you read it, you are, oh, those are not the right ones. Uh, all right, well, there are better reviews than that. Um, the guy who said, I'll buy one, just leave, please, he was annoyed. But um, trust me, there's actually better reviews than that. All right, well, I have to skip past that. So let me get to the, the next one. The next one is actually, this is a picture of um, the first digital ad agency. This was actually founded in 1802. And digital at that point was, you know, will the cow kick you or not when you're done talking to it? Um, but in reality, what was interesting about when we were building the business at this point, this is back in 95, 96, where I got into it and um, helped start one of the agencies at that time, was we always use this analogy all the time, that we were building the plane while flying it. Um, this was something that you heard probably more than you hear the word pivot these days, right? Every day now, it's somebody pivoted, their business pivoted, this pivoted, that pivoted. I'm so tired of pivoting. Um, you're like this in the middle of the room all the time, trying to figure out what you're doing. But we were building a plane while flying it. And what was interesting at that point was that there were no rules to what we were doing. Um, from my own experiences, I was at a company called iTraffic. And I'll show you iTraffic's homepage from that period of time in a second. But we had a bunch of 20-somethings who were running 
the digital ad businesses for Disney and companies that you don't know of anymore, like CD Now, um, Big Book, which was the, one of the first one of the first yellow pages online, and they did a whole bunch of SEO and SEM ads. There was a lot of things that we did back then that um, honestly looked kind of like crazy compared to today's standards. Um, this is an example of the iTraffic homepage. So that first digital agency from 1996, isn't it awesome? You know, I actually wrote some of that copy. I wrote the, we help the best sites on the internet, our clients. By the way, there was like 20 of our clients and there was like 30 sites on the internet. Become the most highly trafficked sites through strategic inbound linking. It's quality, isn't it? <laughs> if you would like to utilize any of that copy, you can repurpose it now because it's probably still accurate. And see that banner at the bottom, that Disney.com banner? It says a whole new look. So the quick story about that is that banner ran in rotation with a series of banners that we ran for Disney. I ran that banner, no joke, for a year and a half. And it was my highest performing click-through banner. That averaged over a year and a half, a 3.5% click-through rate. It beat every other banner I put up for a year and a half. All right? What about this? That's the homepage of Yahoo from 1995. And that's the homepage of Excite. Raise your hand if you know what Excite was. Thank God you do. OK. You know, the version of Yahoo before this, when it was just a, literally a directory of all these sites on the internet. And it scrolled down about four or five pages, and that was it. That was the end of the internet. There was a bunch of other pages, but nobody really cared. Those were the ones. So I pulled those pages just to give you an idea of, once again, if, if your business is 18 years old, or if you have kids that are 18 years old, and they're starting to look at who they are, and they're going to go to college, and they're going to get that chance to reinvent themselves a little bit. That's where we're at. Right? We've done a lot of really cool things in this business. And the people who are about to come up here have helped pioneer a lot of that business. But there's so much further to go. There's such a better opportunity for us to continue to reinvent ourselves. And this is the best time to possibly do that. So with that, I'm going to start asking you guys to come on up here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book. But please come on up so I can introduce you guys. But in this book, there's three primary things that we're going to talk about. So I'm going to bring up the panelists, and I'm going to introduce them as they come up. And what we're going to do is just talk a little bit, reminisce a little bit about what was it like to be involved with the agencies and pioneer that side of the business for as many years as we all did. And then what we're going to do is we're going to break into a town hall. And these four wonderful people are going to duck out, and then we're going to turn this into an open conversation. And what we really want to hear is, what do you think are the areas of the business that need to be pioneered going forward? What areas do need to be innovation going forward? What needs to be happening? What needs to be taking place? What needs to be done to make sure that the business continues to grow and evolves and gets even better? So without any further ado, before I even go into those points up on the page, I'm going to start by introducing Kate Everett Thorpe. Kate is now what is your, your vice chairman of Mobiles Republic, right? And Kate is a pioneer in the agency business for many, many years. Then we have Dave Ivano. Dave is the president of MediaPlex. Another, all these people are in the book, by the way, so when you go home, you can read about them. And they'll even sign it if you want. <laughs> then we have Maggie Boyer Finch. Maggie hasn't been here for a while. Um, I won't tell you what she went to go do, because it's entirely too funny. You have to read it in the book. Right. But well, Maggie's now the CEO and co founder of King of the Web. And last but not least, some of you know too, this is Rick Parkhill. He had something to do with iMedia a long time ago. Um, and he's the chairman of Pop10. He actually founded iMedia. So if you don't know, then you should just give him a round of applause, anyways. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> So can I also have that slide back for a second? Because I want to show one more thing on the slides while we're talking. Maybe. There we go. All right, there's three themes that I want to make sure that we get to hit on while we're talking for a few minutes. I wrote the book, and the first thing about it was that this whole business is about people, not technology. Everybody seems to think this business is about technology. It's about the people that you have in front of you, the people in this room, the relationships that you've been able to build. It's about the relationships as much as it is the smarts. Events like this where people can sit down and they can talk to one another and they can engage with one another and they can have conversations and they can come up with ideas and they can inspire intelligent thinking, that's what drives this business forward. And that's one of the most amazing things that I've gotten out of this business for the last you know, 18 years or so. And it's also about this idea about belief in the face of cynicism because there's too many stories that I know of, and I'm sure you attest to, where people would tell us, what you're doing is crazy. You know, I had my... My boss at my first job asked me when I had to go to my digital agency. She said, why are you going to do that? This internet thing's a fad. It's not going to go anywhere. So she works at Walmart now um, as a checkout person. And it's always going to be about the people, right? No matter what happens for the next 
10, 20 years, it's always going to be about the people. So with that, I'm going to ask these people a question. And I'm going to let you start having more of the discussion. But the theme for the event is partnership. So when you hear about partnership, what do you remember from those early days about partnering with agencies, partnering with vendors, and partnering with the other people in this business? What do you remember about that? Kate, you want to start? Well, we partnered, for one. Um, and we partnered uh, eagerly. The, the early days, for Lot 21, when we started, the way we said it is we don't build the bank, we advertise the bank. So we partnered with every web developer and um, consulting agency that was out there all the time. And we handled um, media creative and after you built the bank. So of course that evolved. Um, but I would say, you know, the number one thing is you, you do partner and it's how well you partner, I think, that leads to um, success or failure. Um, having partnerships that are well structured, are known, um, also that are can be haphazard. You know, you got to be like on the fly for each other and stuff like that, and you're taking risks. But um, really, always looking to what's happening around you and testing things with other people because you can't do everything, and and to do everything well is, is pretty much impossible. And everything is becoming bigger every day. And you'll find that some things come into your wheelhouse, and you embrace them, and you get very good at them, and you bring them in, and you integrate them, and others you keep outside, and you continue to partner. So I would say partner and partner well. Yeah. Um, maybe just a quick story. It, what blew me away when I joined ValueClick at the end of 1999, I helped build the media business over time with ValueClick uh, on my first run there. Uh, but what blew me away initially was the amount of money that was being spent on media where the buyers didn't understand what the value was of what they were buying. Um, we first turned down the ability to uh, identify like geolocation of, of where clicks were coming from. Um, you know, so at some point in 2000, and you realize that a very large portion of traffic is coming from you know international sites. You know, and I'm sure that's not what was being ordered. Actually, the amount of money that it was being spent then was mostly on the dot-com startups. I don't know if they necessarily qualify the type of spend now. They were just trying to get clicks to go, you know, build it into their investor presentation to go raise money or go public. It was kind of a lot of the money that, that companies like ValueClick were taking at the time. Uh, but it, it just blew me away that you could have, talk about an easy sell job. A, a 10 minute phone conversation would get a six figure insertion order, you know, across the fax machine, literally minutes later, right? Salespeople have their- Wait, wait how, how did you get it? How? Just it came through a fax machine? Fax machine, yeah. yeah. We, we faxed yeah. IOs back What's then. That? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Salespeople had their feet up on the desk. You know, the business <laughs> development people you know, had to go find clicks to deliver. Uh, but that was basically the environment. But you know, it was clear that that sort of planning and buying um, and media management wasn't going to last. At some point, we needed to dig into the value of, of, of what was being bought. Like, that needed to translate to real visitors hitting the landing page and then ultimately you know, doing something else, uh, maybe even buying on the site. We actually had a great partnership with Maggie's agency, Avenue A. I'd like to think that ValueClick played a role in that. Uh, we had actually done it with one other um, major advertiser, which was uh, Avenue A had developed uh, an index. We didn't talk about this, but I don't know if you remember <laughs> that. Remember that performance index I you would sure give? Do. Yeah, so that was awesome. For, for companies like ValueClick, where you have a network of 10,000 sites, we were constantly trying to work with our buyers to say, hey, we've got all these sites. We need to know which ones are working and which ones aren't, but we need to be able to pass you know, a site ID on the click string to you, but then you need to feed us back information whether or not it's good or not. And most of the responses back then was, we're not sharing anything with you. That's proprietary to us, blah, 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 you know, figure it out. But it was you know, the agencies that um, understood the value of partnership and that, hey, look, we've got to um, you know, uh, partner more with uh, our media vendors and let them know, uh, you know, what's working, what's not, so they can do their job. And that, that was actually a very successful partnership, I'm sure, with other media vendors uh, that Avenue A worked with. Uh, yeah, thanks for reminding me about that. Yeah. That was pretty smart, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, by way of background, uh, is there, are there any ex-Ave, Razorfish people, Atlas P. Oh, hey. Yeah, let's keep going oh. down the list. There's more. Um, <laughs> so, uh, starting, um, you know, starting in about uh, '95 or so, I started buying some ads for clients who were brave enough to want to do things like, 
you know, put ads on Juno's CD-ROM and some things like that, or maybe that was 93. But, you know, when we launched a, a quirky... CD-ROM. Yeah, right. <laughs> I have never that heard of That was hot. That was all the rage for a while. What? And um, in chat rooms. But we... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they were on AOL. The first signs of UGC. Um, but we, you know, we sort of started out with, with um, this notion that we would partner big and also be, like, the worst partner you could have at the same time. So um, we were very bold about saying, here's what we do and here's what we don't do, and here's who we like to work with to fill any gaps, and here's who we don't like to work with because you're a competitor. I don't see a lot of those bold statements anymore. I see a lot of like, hey, we're all in this together, which I like um, to a certain degree, but I do think we need to get up and shout a little more about what we don't do. Um, as much as what we do, and I think that's going to sort of breed innovation and pride and being really deep in one thing. So it was, it was um, fair to say that I think DoubleClick hated us, and we hated them, um, and it was also probably fair to say that, you know, ValueClick really liked us, and we really liked them, and there was equal value exchange. But I think partnering is sometimes um, only a positive thing if you can still carve out those folks that you can have your competitive rally cry against. It's part of business. We missed you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, you're one of our greatest panelists at every event, and then and then you went away, and we just missed you so much. Three kids. So, yeah, yeah, that'll do it. Too. <laughs> Corey worked through a couple of kids. Um, partnerships. This this industry is built on partnerships. I mean, uh, it wouldn't exist today if people in this business didn't realize the value of partnerships. You know, iMedia got started in 2001 in the fall of 2001, right after an event that occurred in September. Um, and we didn't know if we'd actually have a business or not and throw an event. But my phone started ringing around the middle of September and people saying, we've got to get together. We've got to get this business together because we understand the value of partnerships and we'll never move this business forward unless we have the opportunity to meet you know, in a forum like this. So people like John Durham and, uh, and Jonathan Adams, who's your host here, um, and you know, on the agency side, on the publisher side, they realized that they needed to get together as well. We had this little thing called T's and C's at the time in 2001 that nobody mm -hmm. could figure out. You know, the IAB certainly hadn't. Um, no. But people stayed up 24 hours a day and actually worked on that uh, through the course of that event in uh, November 2001. And that was a partnership effort where people realized that that had to occur for the tide to rise all ships. Yeah. So um, I, I congratulate all of you who, uh, who participate and seek out partnerships, because that's, that's what this, the fabric of this business is all about. Yeah. But I think there, there's an old term from those days, too, co-opetition. Co Everybody remembers that one, which is more to what Maggie was saying, which is like, you did partner, but you knew who you were partnering with and who you weren't. And it did breed um, that co-opetition that they, they gave you still the, the drive to be the one you wanted to still be number one, not just, mm -hmm. you know, have a warm pot. Yeah. I remember when we were at CARA, we ran a study, and the study showed the growth rates uh, or the uptake in any kind of media for the last 100 years. And it showed what the length of period of time it was for television to hit critical mass in the U.S., and then for radio to hit critical mass. And then the Internet comes along and it hits critical mass in one-tenth the time it took for television. And then mobile comes along and it hits critical mass in like 1 20th the amount of time it took for television to hit critical mass. Now, we were hitting critical mass with these new forms of media and all the advertising that was being developed, et cetera. And we went through two recessions during that period of time. It was extremely difficult. There was a recession in 94, 95, 96. There was a recession in 2001, 2002, 2003. Those were big challenges that we all had to face and a lot of other people had to face. What do you think are the challenges that? the group now is going to pioneer going forward, what kind of challenges do they have to face? I think that measurement is, is still a big thing to figure out in general, measurement. Right? I think we, as an industry, we've been really stuck on last click, last view, and I think that works for a very small number of, of clients, but like truly understanding the value of, uh, almost back to the, the early example I gave you, you know, I, I think that same challenge still exists and, and understanding what's the value of what you're buying. It's just gotten a little bit more advanced. I think there's definitely been some developments in the last year or so in terms of, everyone talks about big data, but it's true that uh, IT has gotten to a point where it can support um, 
you know, tracking everything, including non-conversion data, which is really um, the only true way to get to what everyone talks about in terms of being causal. You know, you know did this, uh, did this uh, display impression cause a conversion to happen? Did this email impression or this email click, or this natural search click, you know, was all that truly causal? Um, not enough, I think, is being done in that area, and I still think is, is an area where uh, we as an industry can, can pioneer. Mm -hmm. um, I would say clarity. I think we need clarity in the services we provide. We need clarity in the, our staffing and what their roles are um, and what their services they're to deliver. I think we need clarity in the type of clients you pitch and why. And I think you need clarity among your marketplace. This is one of the most crowded new business development marketplaces ever right now. Um, the amount of companies coming and going and, and the fact that mobile came so quickly in the US, it came that quickly because it was everywhere else. This was one, a game we were late to. So um, this is, you know, everybody had, was using the phone like this way, while we were still using it like this. So, you know, it, there's, I would say clarity among all of those major areas is, is necessary. I, I think that it's, a, it's, it's very foggy for many people. I don't think that people across the board feel like they, can, they have a one-line statement for each of those areas. I think there's a tremendous amount of challenge in this whole multi-screen environment that we find ourselves in and how clients are going to be able to connect with consumers across online, mobile, television, at home. It's this uh, morphing of the video ecosystem and, and it's measurement. It's yeah. how, how do you measure views that are occurring on tele... I mean, the fall ratings right now are off by, what, 15%? Um, you know, the viewership is leaking out past three days. Nielsen wants to extend it to 11 now to get paid. Mm -hmm. um, television audiences are, you know, there's a, just an awful lot of chaos in the whole, you know, uh, video consumption business. And, and, you know, people are talking about GRPs being used online. And there's, there's just an awful lot of chaos there that makes it difficult for the business to advance. Yeah. And I think that's a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my comment on measurement, actually, um, when you start looking at the, the, the device fragmentation, like what happens just on a mobile device going across apps, like we have to pioneer something different than the cookie, right? A cookie, you know, is not going to allow you to track somebody and attribute things properly, right? You have to start inferring who the person is. And I think as an industry, we've got to figure that out. Uh, you know, it just makes it a lot more complicated, the fragmentation of devices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I'll just like take it into a more um, non-specific zone and say that. Uh, Be vague. Be look, very vague. I mean, as people, it's well studied that we are change averse. Like that's just kind of like human nature. And of course, some of us are are more uh, welcoming to change than others. And uh, but but we're change averse. And this and there's no. Um, time when we become more accustomed to routine and stagnation than when we become large, when groups get big. And this industry has gotten big. And a lot of you work at very big companies. And so I'd say if, if there was um, one responsibility that this, this group has moving forward, it's to quit your day job at the big company and go start something small and innovative. I mean, I think it's, or do it within your organization. But, but the, the, resist the temptation to come in and see a standard and accept it and buy it and plan it and sell it um, and really start to sort of, you know, create that kind of dialogue that isn't just about um, whatever the buzzwords are, but really sort of be asking some very fundamental questions um, around: Is that how people buy shit? Is that is that the media they're viewing? Is this the way things happen anymore for a 15-year-old? Mm -hmm. I think that's um, the biggest challenge, and it's. Look, it's, it's, it's enormously hard having been through um, being a small company, loving that kind of chaos, getting purchased by a very large company who shall remain nameless, wonderful company that I hold, hold dear to my heart. But, See, uh, Washington um, something? Yeah, there's just Redmond? like, it started with an M, ended with a soft, it was a weird Don't thing. Don't they do computer stuff? Yeah, some software yeah. thing they do. But you know, big company, and of course we're all familiar with Innovator's Dilemma, and I think, um, you know, it was sort of a, a slap in the face how you could go from driving 60 miles an hour to driving five miles an hour simply because you entered a, a state of largeness. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, um, if you take away one thing from what was so great about our time, mm -hmm. 
Um, it's that it was small. We had no choice but to be innovative. We had no choice but to push the boundaries. No loom escape. That you guys have cool. a much harder job, yeah. which is to resist <laughs> the status quo. So that, that brings a question up that uh, we hadn't talked about necessarily, but it comes out what you're talking about, and it comes out of this theme. So we're talking about partnership being the new agency value. And back in those days, when you went to go to a digital agency, you were innovating. And I would probably argue that the agencies innovated far more than anywhere else because what happened was great ideas were many times incubated out of the agencies and turned into companies. DoubleClick was an agency incubated idea that turned into a really big company. And there's a lot of other examples like that. But to your point, if it is sort of nature of human instinct to not want to change, right? We're risk averse. We don't like to change. But in that point that I brought up is that we were basically staring to the face of cynicism all the time. So how do you compete with an environment that is full of people who are naturally risk averse, that in many cases work at really big agencies now, and really big agencies are very financially risk averse. And the individuals are you're talking about going and starting something new. I mean, we can't have 180 people go start something new. How do you balance all of this in an environment that needs innovation to continue to grow? How do you put this to work? Well, I mean, you, innovators always get a, if you stand on that stool and somebody can't hear you, you put that stool on that stool and you climb it and you shout louder. I mean, you just have to keep pushing. I mean, one of the things is, I mean, you know, there's a thousand sayings, right? You know, good, good ideas that nobody hears. Not is that a good idea, the tree in the woods, all that stuff. You know, it's just, <laughs> if you don't freaking get out and tell people and push. There's that whole Baron Pope thing, and, too. And be willing to be wrong. You know, you guys, part of change and, and innovation is screwing up and learning from that and then dusting yourself off and doing it again. Look, um, you just, you, you have to find, you will find people who say no. And you can keep bumping your head on that wall, and a few of them will come to your side, and then you have to realize the ones that won't, and move on, and find the people who will. And those people are all around you. And some of them think that they are not innovators, or that they don't want to do this, because they are risk averse or otherwise. But you can be that catalyst to bring them into an innovative experience, and create change. But you have to take a step. You know, somebody, you, you, if you sit there and wait for somebody else, you'll most likely still be sitting there. I, I got to believe that maybe innovation and selling innovation through uh, is, is maybe a little easier today. I, I mean, it, it, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, this, you know, CMOs were a lot older, more staid in their beliefs and their marketing strategies. I mean, we've got people now in their 30s that are, are chief marketing officers that actually grew up with a computer that, you know, under, you know, don't have people printing up their emails for them. So, you know, is, that was actually a very common occurrence. It was a long time ago. Is, it's terrifying. You know, I, I, I got it. I mean, from, from where I sit and the people that I've talked to, it seems that at the, you know, at the C level, that people are, are now, you know, it's not, it's not like, well, let's just do what we did last year because no one got fired. It's we've got to think differently. We've, we've got to be innovative. And I think that there's a real hunger for innovation and, and meeting, meeting needs. I mean, you really have to take a look at what, you know, the people that spend the money, what are the clients' needs, and, and how you innovate to meet that. Um, and not just come in with a new piece of technology be, and, and then figure out an application that works with it. Mm -hmm. That what are, where are the pain points, and how do you, and how do you innovate to accomplish uh, the, the, what the client really needs? And if you're in a position of power, if you're sitting out there and you've got a bunch of people you manage and you sit on executive teams and you've, and you've got a real say in things, remember too that like um, invention is, is this thing you have to nurture inside your organization. So like how much skin in the game do your employees have? That's something that was just a given in the 90s when we were starting businesses. And I'm not talking about you're part of the employee stock purchase program. I'm saying like build that and, and you know, not only eat what you kill, but own a big part of it, like really a substantial part of it. Um, and ask yourself whether or not you've really sort of given your people a reason to want to be inventors and innovators as well. That's, that's like, all this is such, such base human stuff. And I think that we sometimes forget, again, as we get in the mindset of being a larger organization to, to just, give people everything they need. I mean, if all of us have probably seen Dan Pink's intrinsic, extrinsic motivation piece, and if you haven't, you should definitely YouTube it and read the book if you actually read books, which I don't. But, but there's this great <laughs> Except thing. Except Corey's. Except Corey's book. Really, Dan? Yeah, come on. One book this year. But yeah. yeah. 
you know. But but become familiar with what's motivating people now, and 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 give them those intrinsic reasons to want to create inside of your organization. Um, that's a that's a big piece of of your responsibility. So it's not just about we got to do this because it's the competitive thing to do. It's like maybe there's something even better than what the competitive thing to do is if I set my people free and I compensate them appropriately to go get it done. You, uh, can we ask a question? Sure, is, go ahead. Is, how many of you feel like the culture of your organization uh, is supportive of innovation and kind of uh, you know, ownership of that? How many of you really feel like you live in that kind of culture? If your boss is sitting next to you, I understand why you're raising yeah. your hand. Let's, let's ask another, who does it? <laughs> I mean, not everybody raised their hand there. They're, I mean, that's yeah. interesting. I, I, so personally, I subscribe to one model of thinking. I'm curious what you think of, which is that when everything is going really great, right? When you put down a strategic plan and everything is running great, that's the perfect time to rip it all apart and start over, right? That's the best time is when you think you've actually hit running speed and things are running and they're smooth and the well-oiled machine is functioning, that's the absolute best time to start over from scratch and to really wow. begin anew. So do, right? you, do you kind of like that idea or do you think that's crazy? Because we're about to do that in a second. That sounds whacked out, Corey. It doesn't mean, you, doesn't mean that you abandon everything you've got running. You can let it run, but you have to know that at some point, what you're doing is going to stop working. Right, the first ad networks, it was huge. You were very integral in getting a lot of these ad networks, the, the, the infrastructure behind them set up, right? That worked for a while, but not so much anymore. Then exchanges come along, and then DSPs come along, and DMPs come along, and data comes along. Inevitably, what you're going to do for the next couple of years is going to stop working. Mm -hmm. So you have to be planning for that stage very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So with that, I'm going to completely change this entire panel now. <laughs> so what we're going to do is, if you could turn these lights on so that we can see everybody who's in here, and you're all going to go on the floor. And who remembers Phil Donahue? Raise your hand if you're not old enough. Phil wow, this is bad. All right, so Phil Donahue was this talk show host. He used to walk around in the audience with a microphone and talk to people. It's very interactive. All right, this group is going to come down, and what we're going to do for a little while now is we're going to ask you to engage with us about what areas of the business need pioneering, what areas of the business require innovation, and what kind of innovation is being developed. So we're going to split the room into quadrants, and maybe you guys can split up on this side. So I've got Dave in the front. I have our Rick first contestant. Weird. All right, so what do you got? What do you think is going on in the business? Where do you think the pioneering is going to happen? Um, my name is David Herscott. I want to mix it up a little bit. Um, so, oh, I, I, who cares? Um, so I'm, I'm on the agency side, and I've been in the agency side since 95, and I worked at Moda Media in South Norwalk with John Nardone and Jocelyn Griffin, and I know you know them very well, but Excellent. that's not the point. The point is, is that I think it's not about innovation. We've lost sight of the importance of brand. You know, in, 90, in 95, we're all excited about technology, but we talked about it in a context of brand equity and the value of brand equity, right? And we've completely lost sight of that. And I know because I still work on the agency side. And our employees, they, you know, our employees, God bless them, they're 25 years old, and they, they just, they weren't trained that way. And so it's not about pushing brand down people's throat, mm -hmm. you know, mass marketing, old school, but it is about what does a brand stand for? And to rip off something from Simon Sinek, Simon said, um, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And I think we've completely lost that. And so, you, you know, technology can help us sort of communicate that, but I think that, um, you know, our clients still struggle, you know, to answer the question why we exist. It's and we need to help them. It's interesting that you would say that. I don't necessarily completely agree with you, but um, I do think it's a good point, because I like things being challenged. Because I would argue that in this day and age, we have some of the strongest brands that have ever existed in history. It's the same brands that everybody likes to you know, cite. You have brands like Apple and brands like BMW and uh, brands like Amazon. These are brands that people know and love and are extremely loyal to. But the way that they've done it, I would argue, is not through advertising. It's definitely through um, customer interaction. It's, uh, it's through CRM. It's through customer experience. I think that they've been able to find ways to take marketing and make it far more broad reaching and far more holistic. Um, that's exactly my point, but the problem is, is that you listed like four or five companies. How many companies do you know that don't know their why and don't know why they exist and don't know like how to interact with customers on customers' terms? Right. So that's a good area to start. So one area that probably needs innovation is I would say, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but in the relationship between the agencies and their brands. 
The agencies and the brands need to figure out how to work together in a more collaborative fashion. The agencies need to push that. Because I, from where I grew up, the agencies were the harbingers of brands. They, it was their job to understand how to create a brand and to teach the brands how to execute against that. And maybe that's been lost a little bit. What else? What other areas do you think we need some help with? This is not a shy room. There's one right here. Hi, Chris Zaharias with Trigget. Um, I've been selling online stuff forever, and one thing I always notice is that everywhere, everyone I sell to always has someone there who's learning something new about how to build a marketing program, an, an online advertising program, and a brand building program. I think if we were to open source a lot of the campaign strategies and the stuff we've done in the past and just make it available in an easily digested format, you'd have tens of thousands of people around the world who wouldn't have to learn from scratch every time because we don't take the time to share everything we've done and the different types of campaigns, the amount of money we've spent or percent of budget we've spent in different area. It's, and it's not that it's a closely guard, guarded secret after the fact, it's just that we don't publish that information. Like for example, doctors have to publish, um, you know, everyone else in, in more regulated industries post that stuff so there's common learning that goes on. Mm -hmm. So knowledge sharing and learning and teaching. Yeah, all, all, this, all the startups and, the, and the, even the big companies I run into where there's people who are asking basic questions like what percent should go to retargeting versus paid search? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how important is attribution? All these things that people in this room and have, have dealt with countless times, none of that gets put in the public domain. It's for, for people to know by the time they get into the space. Yeah, I agree with that too. I, what's an interesting point about that is that, um, I, so I've been writing a weekly column for I'm, it's horrible to say here, media post, right? Competitor and all that. But I've been writing it for 11 years, on every Wednesday for 11 years. And I've loved that because it's always given me the opportunity to think about our business outside of the context of any client request. It gave me the opportunity to think about things that somebody wasn't necessarily asking me the question to right then and there. And I would encourage that that's another thing that either agencies can do or just as individuals. You should all be trying to figure out ways to increase thought leadership, increase the ways that you address the business around you and try to think about things outside of the context of request. So, sounds like a uh, business opportunity for iMedia to uh, create yes. a portal of best practices. Absolutely. Just saying. I don't know. We got one here, Corey. John yep. Bohan here from Social Ties. Dave just pointed me out and told me to stand up, so I'm not quite sure what I'm going to talk about. But uh, as I was thinking about standing up and talking, I started thinking about, well, what brand is really doing it right? If I'm going to think of one brand that is marketing itself effectively, what would it be? So I'm wondering if you're thinking about the same Brian I am, but Red Bull is doing it right. Because you think about it, you know, what's been happening with technology over a period of time, it's been the ability for us to really reach out to the brands and communicate with them. It's less about push marketing, as we all know. It's less about ads being pushed at us and more about how we interact with those ads. So I think about Red Bull because they're really creating advertising. You don't see them really running commercials. What do they do? Everybody saw the the space um, jump, uh, yes, about you know, two months ago or so. They're also creating new sports in Canada. They're doing all these great things, and they just have their, their logo on the side of the helmet. So I think what, you know, the big innovation over the next few years is probably going to be, I mean, this is self-serving because I'm from Social Ties, but I think it's in social media. It's in creating earned media. You know, how can we even use paid media to create earned media? Because in the end, the best advertising is your friend telling you about a product. The best advertising is about what you hear from other people, and that's so much more powerful than any brand telling you to buy their product. So I think what we are really looking at is how do we get more earned media. Okay. So earned right. media is an area. What about on this side of the room? Got one over here. Maggie. Okay. Let's go with Maggie first. Hi, I'm Fraser Elliott from Kramer Crassolt, and I want to go off the branding comment over here. I had a client not that long ago who said, don't talk to me about branding, because branding is a one-word excuse to waste my money. I think I know that guy. I think we all know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and if we want to get ourselves, from a, as a digital world, we all lament the fact that we're stuck in the click-through. If we want to get ourselves up out of the click and understand the, the top of the funnel through the mid-funnel and down to the bottom, we need to, we need to help our clients, we need to help agencies help their clients understand the value that digital brings to the table and the other media bring to the table together. If this is all about partnership, then we should be figuring out ways to go beyond attribution of digital and help clients understand attribution of all of their efforts 
so that branding is no longer a dirty word. Because we can't afford not to brand. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, if there's only so many clicks you can get, there's only so many, there's only so many conversions you can get when you're not filling that funnel. So I would say that the innovation we need in the next few years is to help that attribution throughout the funnel, multi-channel, multimedia. So let me do a thing. I so agree. Everybody who's in an agency, raise your arm. All right, everybody who's in an agency that is working on an attribution model, keep your arm up. And every one of you that's actually doing this for a brand campaign, keep your hand up. It gets real small when you get down to level. Because I agree with you. I think that attribution needs to be figured out. It needs to be figured out sometime in the next two to three years. And it needs to be figured out for both branding and direct response. And that hasn't happened yet. Hey, thanks. Uh, uh, Stephen, uh, second question today. I feel privileged. Thank you. Uh, the, the place I come back to for innovation for us, and I am HC side, um, we were born out of the search world. We still do that for our clients, is, um, is discovery. Back to the non-specific zone that uh, you spoke about up here. I look at the heritage here of the, the screens of people looking for sites and the end of the internet is four scrolls down. Is it really a, a, a white text box is, is the best we can do? Mm -hmm. um, that sense of discovery, we see it in vertical markets, in the entertainment, trying to figure out how to get discovery out there in a way that's unique, but, but that goes across, I think, everything. And I think it's some place that we play in agencies where we can, I would hope, help figure that out because we know how we can help clients monetize that. But again, um, the white screen with the blank text box, let's bite the hand that feeds. Is that all we can do? I, I don't think it is. Yeah, discovery and creativity, the ability to think creatively about how to deliver a message. Corey, I know you kind of want us to chime in with you on some of this Please. stuff. Please. But I would say um, a little bit of what John was talking about earlier. If this were, a, um, if this were an entrepreneur's summit or uh, product developers at a, on the client side, I'd say that scary little phrase that says, if you have to spend a lot of marketing dollars, it probably means your product isn't that good. Um, and that's sort of a frightening thing to think about because then those products often get tossed to us as marketers, right? So can you sell this because it's not selling? And it's your fault pretty much if you don't come up with an ad plan that makes this shitty product sell. So, you know, there's, there's, there's sort of so many pieces to discovery which starts with the product itself and then, and then untangling whether or not we have a great product to sell. But when I think about how um, fundamental selling something becomes, it really sort of comes right down to word of mouth, which is kind of like being born again <laughs> when you think about marketing. It's word of mouth. We all know through study after study after study that the most potent form of advertising is somebody trusted telling somebody else who trusts them to go buy this or use this product or service. And social media all of a sudden gave us back word of mouth. So all of you who are thinking about the fundamentals of marketing and how to push a product or a service really do owe it to yourself to think about word of mouth, social media, how those things play together. And I'm not talking about putting ads next to somebody's timeline on Facebook that's targeted or doing a promoted tweet. I mean, that's great stuff. And I'd like to refer to that as sort of maintenance marketing in the social sphere. But I'm really talking about how you create dialogues amongst groups of people who are interested in a product or service and who are also peak influencers in those groups um, within social media circles. That's like we're getting back to the basics. So anyway, I'd say discovery comes from finding influencers and spreading word of mouth. Kate? Um, I'm glad someone brought up attribution modeling as an innovation space, but I'd, I'd even take it back. I wish, I hope, I'm not, I'm not sold that it'll actually happen this year or, or that we alone in this room could, could do it. But I think we, I'd love to see us go back to the core roots of marketing data, marketing analytics, and somebody have the guts to, to say, okay, just because a, a key metric has been around for years and years and years doesn't mean that it's still right. And just because they're comfortable with it doesn't mean it's still right. And I think if we don't do some innovation around the bare bones of that before we start digging into the more complex things, then we're just still gonna be stuck with looking at three years backwards to try to predict the next 10 years and, and a, a basic delivery metric based on somebody writing in a book. What's wrong with it, books it, again? It may not happen next year because no. it's hard. The attribution problem I think is hard. Somebody um, I was talking to referred it as changing your religion. Mm -hmm. you know, if you were to change from Catholicism to some other religion, let's say, that's not, that doesn't happen in a year. Uh, it's a big investment, I think. And maybe agencies need to figure out a way to charge for this or, you know, you know use people to help, you know, put that argument forth. But it's a big investment in terms of developing your data strategy, 
getting all your tracking in place. It's going to require a partnership potentially with multiple vendors. Um, getting um, like a new understanding of of how you're going to track things all the way through to a return on ad spend. I'm telling you, if you if you lock down your data capture, um, you develop an attribution model that's unique to your business type and your conversion types. You can pioneer and innovate all you want. You can throw everything against that, and it's all going to fall out in that form of measurement. I think that's that's key to getting our digital spend to a much higher level. And with CPG, um, we're starting to experiment with um, just um, using like IRI panel data, right? It doesn't all have to be conversions that happen uh, online. You can track uh, attribution, you can track you know, the effect on return on ad spend all the way through to an in-store purchase if you're partnered with panel data. Anyway. Yeah, one thing uh, I, I, I realized today, my, my, my daughter, I have a two and a half year old daughter, and she has a touch screen. We only let her watch things that are on demand yeah, child, because you want to control what your kids watch when they're that little. And I just realized that even from that age, kids are getting used to selecting, look, well, at least the parents are selecting what they watch. There's no commercials on Netflix. And I almost feel like within less than a decade, and I don't know how many parents are in here and how, how, how you control what your kids are watching, but your kid, like my child right now is used to watching specific characters like, uh, what's his name, George uh, Pocoyo, which is an England cartoon. But she'll say, I want this, I want this. There's no commercials, right? It's on demand. And I feel like within less than a decade, a lot of the things that, were, that, that are really basic to us are, are just going to go away. So we need to get ready and say, well, what percentage of parents here control what their kids watch on demand without commercials? And I know my traditional media buyers are always like, what? You don't let your kid watch regular television? I'm like, well, she's two and a half. You know, I don't want her to do that. So that's something to think about as far as innovating. Well, well what's going to happen in, in a decade if... 40% of people watching traditional media are, are just, no, I just want to watch what I want my kids to watch, and they like what I kind of point, you know, control. So that's just a thought mm -hmm. that we need to be ready for that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I remember when we used to rip out ads from magazines that had a URL in them because it was so few and far between. And nowadays, if you look at an ad, it's silly not to have a Facebook ad, a Facebook, a Twitter, and a website address in it, and there's no phone numbers anymore. Hey, Corey, um, we've got we have time for one more question. Um, nobody talked about creative. I'd like to see more innovation in the creative space. I mean, that's something I've been passionate about for 12 years. I'm actively uh, working on it myself, and I'm not going to pitch my company, uh, Republic Project. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> and what does that but, uh, company do, Adrian? I've heard they're awesome. Uh, Corey knows about it. Uh, but it's like that's where I'm starting to see some real innovation with companies like Flight and what Dave's doing and, and some of the big ad exchanges, like crossing all the screens. I mean, I think that's a very interesting part. And then another thing no one mentioned, well, some people started to mention data communication, but I've seen communication just become scattered. And like really sitting down with a partner and really just having a good conversation. I get Facebook texts about campaigns that people want to run with me. Like, I'd like to just see it be like, pick up the phone, have a call, hear the tone, understand what the objections are or what uh, of the campaign and then put together uh, a thoughtful response, and I'm seeing a lot of it done over text message or Facebook, and, and I think we're slowly getting away from what you guys were probably doing way back in the day when you sat around a room and drank a bunch of beer and figured out how to make the campaign work for the brand. <laughs> yeah. So at this point, because we start to run close on time, I'm going to have my panelists come back up. So a town hall could actually go on for probably three hours, and I originally petitioned to have like three hours for the session, but you know that wasn't going to work. Um, but first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who's actually started talking and putting in some, some ideas. So give, your all, give yourselves a hands of applause. Can I, get, can I get back to the very, very last page of my deck? No? Maybe. Come on, sit down for a second. <laughs> all right, well, I didn't really need it. It wasn't that important. Um, you know, people don't change. We there's two things that I want to wrap matters. up with. Okay. I don't like it. So the agency <laughs> business, you know, I was in the agency business for 18 years, and I love the agency business. I mean, honestly, I'm not in it now, but I love it. And what you have is an opportunity for partnership and to create value and to really push ideas forward. It's, it's very unique. Oh, I got my page. I love my page. Um, <laughs> but what we talked about in this brief town hall, I heard that there is a need for innovation in developing understanding to how to create a brand, how to foster brand relationships. I think agencies, that's probably the single most um, intrinsic value that's there that's, that still needs to be tapped into and needs to be continued to be broadened and expanded upon. Teaching, knowledge sharing, learning, that all needs to continue to develop. And I heard three or four people at this conference specifically talk about ideas for how to do that. And I'd love to see people pursue that. Brand communication, whether it's through earned media or other, 
just making sure that you're still talking about singular messages and it's resonating with your audience, that you find ways to measure that and develop attribution models, not only for driving direct response advertising results, but for driving brand results. Discovery and creative, making sure that you're delivering a message in a new, unique way. I mean, to this date, I'm still surprised that, I'm not surprised that we got rid of the 468 by 60. That's good. <laughs> but I'm still surprised we have a 728 by 90. I'm still surprised we have these standard ad units, which are so standard. You know, why isn't there going to be something that's a little bit more creative that's actually being pushed forward? And then com personal communication, the ability to actually talk to one another and to convey ideas and to have a conversation like we were just having a minute ago. So I'm going to end on one basic story, really. And I'm going to ask um, each of you to give me one thing that you look back on from that pioneering stage of the business. What's one thing that you look back on and you're most proud of that you think has applicable learning for going forward? You take a wow, second to think about it. <laughs> I know, it's hard, but what's one thing that you're so proud of that you did? Anybody, you want to start? All right, I'll, I got one. I, I have. So we. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's hard. Can you only talk one about thing. It? Can I talk about it? <laughs> we went to a conference. I think it was like, an, like the first ad tech um, and dressed one of our sales guys up in a gorilla suit. And we called him Roy, R-O-I. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in some ways, this is, the, this is the beginning of what I'm most proud of, but also what I think screwed you guys up so badly. And it's that we <laughs> came in so hard saying advertising is so screwed up. The first time that John Wanamaker quote started getting used was mm. when we started hitting all the agency conferences and we'd go, 50% of what you spend, you don't know what, you know. And, we hit it so hard with the idea that click-through click rate wasn't enough, that CPA wasn't enough, that ROI unplugged wasn't enough, that last click attribution wasn't enough, that you know, what mattered here was take every bit of your marketing intuition and cram it into a bunch of cookies and data and it'll spit out the right answer for you when you hit the big sort of optimization button, red button. And it was really exciting and innovative thinking. But it was, and it was so powerful um, that it became a, a, like a battle cry. Um, for an industry. And now for a decade plus, you guys are crawling out from underneath that battle cry, trying mm. to get back to brand, trying to get back to creative, trying to get back to intuition and word of mouth and the way that human beings actually like things and distribute them from one person to the next in a very human way. And so I'm very proud that we upended an industry who really just relied all on instinct. Yeah, we ran some commercials, some people showed up at the store, it was great. You know, to, a, to, a, to an industry that actually thought about, really, really thought about how products moved um, and how purchasing happened because finally we kind of could, right? Because mm -hmm. we, could, we could put little ankle bracelets on all the pigeons. But I think it's also at the same time something that I, I sort of feel like I wish I could undo some of the potency of that so that we could also balance this thing back out and get back to some really important fundamentals of marketing that have been forgotten a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean they don't have science. There's a lot of science to those fundamentals, but it doesn't all boil down to a single action and a single sale. And all of you, whether you're brand marketers or direct response marketers, I bet are more educated about that single moment of purchase than any brand marketer has ever been before. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, you know, just in keeping with the theme of, of going back and reflecting back very early on, uh, I remember if we were serving house ads within our network by uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that meant that we were kind of like sold out. We didn't have enough, you know, campaigns sold on the network. And it really kind of spelled out the need for, you know, better, you know, optimization. That kind of became the term that we had discussed. So the first problem was, okay, just kind of like pacing, like, you know, um, you know, optimizing your, your yield management so that publishers would be happy throughout an entire day, not you know, yanking the relationship halfway through the day. Um, but then that led to just more and more innovation around uh, delivering more and more value to our clients, like truly understanding you know, what within the network was, um, was you know, driving value. And today, you know, I only choose to spend my time with agencies and brands that really care about tr you know, getting to understand true uh, return on ad spend measurement. Like, I'm going to give you money not to, you know, pull off this awesome campaign, but I'm trying to sell my product. I'm trying to make a profit as, as, a, as a brand. 
And it's, it is a big undertaking to do that well. Um, and I think that anything else that is doing outside of that sort of infrastructure is you know, just kind of like a nice event. You know, it was a nice campaign. You know, maybe the CEO is happy that so many people showed up at a certain uh, live event. But I really think that you know, our early um, innovation within optimization is just getting to a whole nother level now as it goes you know, across an entire digital media plan and it starts to include cross-channel. Um, it's pretty exciting, I think, from that standpoint. Um, it's hard to be super proud of something that I think is currently antiquated, but back then, um, I would say I'm proud to have co-authored what an impression is and to then sell that across to the agencies, the clients, and the sellers and get that out there. And that accelerated money immediately because we could, we weren't, I mean, when I first bought ads at the same time Mag, um, was, it was, you bought the homepage for a month and you never knew what you got. I still have a, a my fax, which is now like disappearing. The ink is like going away. Um, yeah, the, That's thermal the disappearing fax, fax the thermal. Um, my insertion order for the homepage of Wired um, for Sprint, and I was right next to MCI, and then they put Club Med in between us, and they called that competitive separation. And, and, and that was it, you know? And I was like, whoa, that's totally not competitive separation, but we'll talk it later. Um, and, you know, it was $10,000 for 30 days of the homepage of Wired. And that was all you had. And so when we wrote what an impression was and we put that forward um, and got that in, it was the beginning of being able to legitimize this media and then work towards mass. So I would say I was very proud to have participated with that. I really wished clicks hadn't followed so quickly because as I often had said, it was a media planner's heroine and they couldn't get off the stuff. So no matter, it was never mattered what the hell the campaign was supposed to be about, it was all about the clicks. Mm. And it was like, well, it may not be. So um, anyways, and I know that now how many years later, close to 20, um, we are working Jeez. towards changing what is an impression. So I think it's also stood a long time, which I think it could have been changed some time ago. Right. Close to 20. This, um, our oxen are parked at, if somebody go feed them, I think the meters do. Right? It's like we well drove these pioneer wagons in. 20 years, huh? Um, I'll tell you the thing I, I'm most proud of, Corey, you put up a bullet point earlier about uh, belief in the face of cynicism. Um, we went through a lot of that, you know, 10, 12 years ago, all of us, uh, you know, oxen riding pioneers had to do that. And, and, you know, every one of these iMedia summits, the theme was something about, you know, deserving, uh, you know, our, our place at the table, you know, our spot on the, on the, on the basketball court. I think you, you played a lot of different roles in those sort of things and all the different metaphors that we created about we deserve to be a part of the marketing mix. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a rallying cry for this business for a long time. And I'm proud of what iMedia did uh, to, to move this business forward. Um, in fact, tomorrow I'm, I'm flying to New York. Tomorrow morning I'm having dinner with uh, David Cohen and Nick Pajade, who were, when I met them in Aspen 13 years ago, mm -hmm. were digital media planners. And, mm -hmm. and now David is the uh, Chief Media Officer for Universal McCann, runs all TV and digital. Uh, Nick is the CEO of Initiative. So, you, you know, digital guys that rose to the top of the whole, of the whole media budgets. So, I'm, you know, I'm proud that we, that, that, and, and, and all, uh, uh, you know, most of you in this room played a, probably played a part in that, that we're true believers that digital was for real and that it had a place and now it's, <coughs> now, now, and that, I think that battle's been won. <laughs> um, so the future and the, of, of how you innovate and partner is, is yeah. really the question. So I'm going to end with a quick story. It's actually, it is a story that's in that book, and it's a story in Scott McLernan's chapter. And I found this to be probably the, as I went back and read the whole stories on, in the book itself, this was probably the story that I thought was the most appropriate for what we were going to talk about today, which was that he was telling a story about how, and many of you have been in this exact same situation. Maybe you spent an entire day in New York, you're flying out to the West Coast, it's the nine o'clock flight or whatever flight it is towards the end of the day. And you can picture this, right? All the lights are off, people around you are tired, and there's that one guy who's about three or four or five rows up in front of you and he's got his laptop open. 
And it's this shining beacon, this aura of light that's going on in the plane. And Scott said this story about how whenever he felt like he was tired, he'd sit on his plane and he'd close his laptop and get ready to open a book and he'd see that one person that was three or four or five rows up in front of him. And that one person was always putting a little bit more time and a little bit more effort to continue thinking and to trying to develop some idea for his business. That always motivated Scott. So he'd just open up his laptop and for the rest of the flight he'd sit there and do as much work as he could because he loved this business and he also felt competitive that he didn't want that person who was five rows ahead of him to be better or smarter than he was. And I know from my own perspective, I've been competitive too, but I love this business. And I think everybody here loves this business. We put up with a lot of shit in this business over the last 20 years. That's three so. shits in this session. <laughs> it's all right. We're looking I've back. I've been keeping track. Out. We, put yeah, up we with didn't a lot. used to allow that kind of shit here. Yeah, hey. We put up things with a lot have of, changed. We put up with a lot of crazy things in our careers so far. But we're 18 years into a business that's going to continue to grow for many, many years. And it's going to continue to literally, I mean, it's silly, but we're changing the world of how brands interact with customers. And whether it's we're doing it right or not right now, whether we need to continue to work on it, we're going to. And we're going to come out of this, and it's going to be pretty earth shattering what we've actually accomplished. So that's where I'm going to end. I want to thank everybody here. So please give my panelists a round of applause. I want to Let's thank iMedia, and I want to thank you because the next 18 years are up to you. So you know, don't screw it up. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you guys